And now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our morning keynote speaker, the Honorable Helen Whitener. She is amazing. She is incredible. She is my friend, sister, and colleague. I want her to have every single second to interact with us this morning because her journey, her story, her gift, her wisdom is powerful and I would go so far as to say life transforming. Please join me in welcoming the Honorable Helen Whitener, Pierce County Superior Court Judge. pleasure to be here this morning to chat with you and thank you for the opportunity. Following our Lieutenant Governor Habib's speech, and I will say we did not confer in preparing our statements to you, I will start with this. Lately, we are seeing from the public an increasing dissatisfaction and lack of confidence in our government. All levels of government are fair game to include the judiciary. There is a belief that government agencies, particularly, well, agencies apparently, don't know that the public matters and that if we cannot see why, then we are part of the problem. Although the populations we serve are diverse, Many of our public agencies lack a diverse workforce. The perception amongst marginalized populations is that our agencies don't care and are not welcoming. That a person from a marginalized background is hired for optics or to meet some minimum quota allotment. There's a perception that the agency then believes that its action is enough and that it is sending the right message, a message that it has a diverse workforce and is inclusive. The message that is received, however, by a marginalized person like me is, marginalized person, you need not apply. Diversity is seen as lacking, equity is not present, and inclusivity is an illusion. The result is there is a lack of public trust and confidence in us, the service providers, and with the services we deliver. We are failing, and some may even say that we are failing miserably in our duties as public servants to offer the public a diverse workforce representative of all of the people in our state. It appears that we have forgotten that first and foremost, we are public servants, and our duties are to serve all of our fellow citizens. One of the questions we must answer is, are we treating everyone, whether we are providing a service or providing a job, with dignity and respect, and without special privileges, discrimination, or bias? State agencies are often perceived by marginalized groups as having policies that are either arbitrary or arbitrarily applied. The end result is the perception of unequal and inequitable treatment being encouraged. The workplace is seen as locked and based on nepotism. What matters is not what you know, but who you know that gets you ahead. It is not how good you are, but rather how long you have been inside the agency that matters. Many of the same policies that were meant to be inclusive and to promote diversity within our government agencies have actually created institutional barriers to diversity. You are the human face of your agency, and persons seeking services and or employment 
look to the composition of your agency and persons, your agency, sorry, as a measure of how well you represent them or how accessible you are to them. Any disparity between what you say and what the public sees undermines their confidence in your agency. A legal historical view of the disenfranchisement of marginalized individuals in America is insightful in understanding their perspectives and beliefs. So I'm going to take you on a legal journey. In 1857, the US Supreme Court decided the case of Dred Scott versus Sanford. Dred Scott was a slave in Missouri. He sued for his freedom, claiming he had lived for a time in a free territory and therefore was a free man. The court ruled against him, saying that under the Constitution, he was his master's property. The Chief Justice Roger Taney, seen on the right, in the decision summarized the historical attitudes of their time. He said, Black Africans imported as slaves had for more than a century before been regarded as beings of an inferior order and altogether unfit to associate with the white race, either in social or political relations, and so far inferior that they had no rights which the white man was bound to respect, and that the Negro might justly and lawfully be reduced to slavery for his benefit. He was bought and sold and treated as an ordinary article of merchandise and trafficked whenever a profit could be made by it. What's important about this case is that Justice Taney's opinion was at that time the fixed and universal view of the white race. No one thought of disputing these flawed notions and the white race in every position in society, daily and habitually, acted upon it in their private and public pursuits, and they never doubted for a moment the accuracy of this view. This, ladies and gentlemen, was only 162 years ago. Less than 40 years later, in another case, the Supreme Court upheld the Louisiana law which established a separate but equal doctrine requiring restaurants, hotels, hospitals, and other public places to serve blacks in separate but superficially equal accommodations. That case was Plessy versus Ferguson. And Justice John Marshall Harlan was the only justice to dissent, the only justice to dissent from the majority view held at the time. He wrote, the white race deems itself to be the dominant race in this country. And so it is in prestige, in achievements, in education, in wealth, and in power. So I doubt not it will continue to be for all time if it remains true to its great heritage and holds fast to the principles of constitutional liberty. But in view of the Constitution, in the eye of the law, there is in this country no superior, dominant, ruling class of citizens. There is no caste here. Our Constitution is colorblind and neither knows nor tolerates classes among citizens. In respect of civil rights, all citizens are equal before the law. The humblest is the peer of the most powerful. The law regards man as man and takes no account of his surroundings or of his color when his civil rights as guaranteed by the supreme law of the land are involved. We boast of the freedom enjoyed by our people above all other peoples, he continued, but it is difficult to reconcile that boast with a state of the law which practically puts the brand of servitude and degradation upon a large class of our fellow citizens, our equals before the law. This, ladies and gentlemen, was only 122 years ago. And Justice Harlan's view was the view of the very small minority. Now what is interesting is that while Justice Harlan appeared to advocate for equality 
among those of different races. In the same opinion, he also went on to say, there is a race so different from our own that we do not permit those belonging to it to become citizens of this, the United States. I allude to the Chinese race. As you can see, Justice Harlan did not embrace the idea of full social racial equity, equality. And during these times, similar views were held in regards to people of Spanish and Mexican heritage. These false ideas of the worth of people with different backgrounds and cultures were fixed and universal opinions accepted and acted upon by the white race. The accuracy of these views was never doubted for a moment and for another 58 years, Jim Crow was the law of the land and was only rejected and overruled in 1954. That is 64 years ago. In America, equality for marginalized populations has always been a difficult concept to implement because of systemic, institutional, and structural racism. Intolerance for differences has historically been pervasive and it has not just been based on race. There was cultural intolerance as well. In Nebraska, Robert Meyer was convicted for teaching German in a school. There was a Nebraska state law that prohibited the teaching of modern foreign languages in public schools. Thankfully, the Supreme Court struck down the law in this decision. However, as the picture on the right shows, changing the law does not always correlate with changing minds, and that is true even today. Less than 100 years ago, in another case, Lum v. Rice, Marta Lum, a nine-year-old Chinese-American, was prohibited from attending a high school in Mississippi solely because she was of Chinese descent. Martha was forced by compulsory attendance laws to attend school, but there was no school in the district maintained for Chinese students. The Supreme Court held that separate schools shall, not may, shall, be maintained for the white and colored races. The court determined that white meant Caucasian, and if you were not white, which included Mongolian or yellow race, or of Asian ancestry, you were colored. This decision effectively approved the exclusion of minority children from schools reserved for whites. When dealing with diversity, it is prudent to understand how individual aspects of identities, whether it is gender, race, sexual orientation, class, or the like, intersect with the culture to include the legal culture operating at the time. It can be insightful in understanding or explaining the perceptions marginalized populations hold and possibly why. I am defined as a black, gay, immigrant, disabled woman. And those are just a few of the labels created to not only describe who I am, but also to try and define who I am. It has given me, however, a unique frame of reference, that of an outsider. As a judge, it allows me to appreciate assumptions and stereotypes underpinning many legal doctrines and allows for possibly overlooked interpretations, analyses, and approaches to the law and equity. Simply said, as a black judge, I may see a situation differently than a white judge. As a disabled judge, I may see a situation differently than an able-bodied judge. As a gay judge, I may see a situation differently than a heterosexual judge. Well, you get the picture. Legal analysis requires interpretation of the law. And different perspectives can ensure not only equality, but also equity in the application of the law. Now, Justice Thurgood Marshall was America's first African-American Supreme Court Justice. 
Before that, he had a trailblazing legal career. One spent fighting for civil rights, racial equality, and fairness in the criminal justice system. When Justice Marshall retired from the court, his colleagues reflected on what they termed his unique perspective and how it influenced their deliberations. Justice Byron White said, Justice Marshall brought to the conference table years of experience in an area that was of vital importance to our work, experience that none of us could claim to match. He would tell us things that we knew but would rather forget. And he told us much that we did not know due to the limitations of our own experience. Justice White's comments embodies one of the many benefits of embracing diversity in backgrounds as well as in experiences. Diversity entails understanding and respecting that everyone is unique. It entails recognizing and accepting our individual differences. It is usually discussed only in terms of race, gender, sexual orientation, ethnicity, physical abilities, and those are extremely important. However, in government agencies, diversity of professional backgrounds should also matter. <clears throat> Because of systemic discrimination in employment hiring decisions, many marginalized groups have life and work experiences that are discounted in hiring decisions. A person should not be required to discount their life experiences, but rather those experiences should be added to the equation and considered. We should then assess the value and worth. I would need some more. Thank you. We should then assess the value and worth of what the, that individual brings to the task at hand. Maybe I put it over on this side. This will ensure that more varied experiences and perspectives be drawn upon in addressing solutions to problems. A more diverse workforce does not undermine the quality of your agency. It enhances it. A workforce that reflects the community within which it works by bringing different backgrounds and perspectives to the table increases public trust and confidence in that agency. Diversity in government workforces should be a priority rather than an afterthought. The public must see us as being accessible. They must see you as being transparent and fair in your dealings, and that includes your hiring decisions. It is a privilege to be a public servant. We have a duty to those we serve, to always work towards equal and fair treatment, to be accountable, impartial, and just. After all, just treatment is justice. Access to just treatment requires equality. However, in America, using equality as a goal in addressing problems of diversity or integration may be an inherently flawed concept because of historical, systemic, and institutional racism. Equality deals with providing the same treatment for all. Many of our early legal cases utilize what I call an equality lens approach to the issues of diversity or integration. This approach would work beautifully if we were all starting from the same place. And therein lies the flow. As we know, that is not the case. In 1946, five, five Mexican-American fathers challenged the practice of Mexican school segregation. The Mendez family had previously attended white schools without problems. But after moving to Westminster Orange City, Orange County, California, 
they suddenly found their children forced into separate schools from Mexicans. This court case, Mendez v. Westminster, was the first case that argued that separate but, un, separate but equal sorry, was unconstitutional. This case was the catalyst for the successful arguments made eight years later in the better known Brown versus Board of Education case. Now in the Mendez trial, the school system's argument to maintain separate schools was that they were treating the Mexican American children equally by providing an education particularly suitable for them. Their experts testified that the children could not speak English even though no one had given them language tests. The school district's witnesses testified that the children's hands and faces were generally dirty, that they lacked proper clothing and cleanliness of body and mind, had no manners, and were retarded in their ability to learn. The judge who presided over the case rejected these arguments, stating that all racially based intellect claims came from the segregation of such races, creating an unequal environment. He also went on to state, the evidence clearly shows because of segregation, Spanish speaking children are retarded in learning English. Because of a lack of exposure to its use and that commingling of the entire student body would instill and develop a common cultural attitude among school children, which is imperative for the perpetuation of American institutions and ideals. Now the judge had the right intent, but his delivery surely needed some work. The better known case of Brown versus Board of Education came in 1954, and that's only 64 years ago, where the Supreme Court finally held that in the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place. Numerous cases applying an equality lens to address issues involving women's rights, Chinese American rights, or LGBT rights, for example, then followed. But even where people fought for equality, it meant different things to different groups because they were all starting from a different place. and I must have jumped quite ahead. Equity, on the other hand, is synonymous with fairness and neutrality. It includes providing access to opportunity. However, because of the persistent plague of historical and institutional racism in America, it is important when dealing with our multicultural population that our agencies encourage accessibility by identifying and removing historical and institutional barriers to accessing opportunities. It is true, and I can't, this thing is very sensitive. <laughs> it is true that you are responsible for selecting or promoting the best candidate and not just the best minority or female candidate. But best is in the eye of the beholder. And that sometimes gets in the way of finding the best. For example, you have two applicants vying for a position in your agency. The first applicant is qualified and has 20 years of experience. The second applicant is from a marginalized group and is also qualified and has 10 years of experience. Both are equally qualified for the position. If I was to ask who gets the position, the usual response is the person with 20 years of experience. And if I ask why, the frequent response is because that applicant has been doing it longer for 20 years. 
I challenge you to see that equality, le equality lens decision as inherently flawed. The flaw is that these two people are superficially equal. They are equal as it pertains to qualifications for the position, but the reality is that the marginalized individual had to overcome historical, systemic, and institutional barriers just to be considered equally qualified, and had to do it in a shorter amount of time. Ask yourself, why do you perceive the person who has mastered the task in half the time as less worthy of the position than the person who took twice as long to master the task? If how long an applicant has been working at a task is to be the barometer for hiring, you have just created another barrier for the black individual, the disabled individual, the immigrant, the marginalized individual. Remember the Myers case where the courts saw the Mexican children as inferior, although they spoke and understood two languages. It is interesting that the court only saw the benefit to integration as flowing one way, and that is from the white children to the Mexican children, where there was great benefit to integration for the white children as well. Assumptions about a person based on their race, gender, ethnicity, sexual orientation, age, or disability, all of which I claim, to name a few descriptors, tell you nothing about that person's abilities or worth. You are the gatekeepers to access. Your privilege is that you have the keys to increase diversity within your agency. For marginalized persons to gain access to opportunities, the reality is you must allow marginalized persons in. It starts with you. When you review and write the applicable standards and job descriptions for your agency, root out the very bias that remains the basis of your inability to get to a diverse workforce. The concept of perception is intertwined with the concept of equity. To change the perception marginalized groups have of our government agencies, it is our responsibility to adjust and remove attitudes, norms, beliefs, and practices that perpetuate discrimination. This would help create a more welcoming and inclusive environment. Diversity and inclusion do work in tandem, but just like equality is not synonymous with equity, diversity is not synonymous with inclusion. You can create a diverse workforce and it not be inclusive. It is important that you review the culture of your agency because inclusion requires that a person's individuality not only be seen, but that it also be valued. Visibility is often very difficult for marginalized individuals as it exposes the individual to blatant discrimination, vile and hateful rhetoric and actions. Even where the rhetoric or actions are not perceived as vile and hateful, microaggressions in daily interactions and communications in the workforce and the workplace creates an unfriendly and uncomfortable work environment for marginalized individuals. Your privilege is that you have the keys to create a more diverse, equitable, and inclusive workplace at your respective agencies. You have the power required to dismantle the systemic barriers that are still present in the workplace. <clears throat> in understanding inclusion, let us take a legal historical view of how marginalized groups have been excluded or disenfranchised in the law. It may shed some light on why their perception of government agencies is what it is and why ad addressing it 
should continue to matter. Korematsu versus United States is a Supreme Court case where the court ruled that the government was justified in its internment of Japanese American citizens because it was a circumstance of emergency and peril in the wake of the Pearl Harbor attack. 23-year-old Fred Korematsu was an American citizen of Japanese ancestry who refused to go to the internment camps and was incarcerated for it. Immigration and citizenship have always been difficult issues and have been used to exclude others with differences. Many parallels are at play even today. Requests for inclusions are often, requests for inclusion are often confused with and wrongly viewed by many as requests for special rights and privileges. In 1996, 23 years ago, a Colorado amendment denied protections against discrimination to gays and lesbians because it provided them with special rights. The Supreme Court found this amendment unconstitutional. I think, okay, it's still going. Unconstitutional, and Justice Kennedy in his decision held that the protections requested were not requests for special rights. They, he said, constitute ordinary civil life in a free society. Providing access is not providing special rights. I challenge you to see such requests as requests for inclusion. Whether it is a request to be married or a request to have ramps instead of stairs, thank you, or a request to use a public bathroom, or a request after being convicted for a crime and having done the time for an opportunity to earn an income. An inclusive approach is an equal and equitable approach that removes institutional and or structural barriers and allows participation. It reminds us that yesterday it was me, but tomorrow it may be you. Employer practices that had a discriminatory effect on minorities and women was prohibited in the early 1970s. Tests and other employment practices that disproportionately screened out African American applicants from jobs were prohibited when shown not to be job related and gender requirements were, in most job postings were also prohibited. One recent parallel I thought about is the band box, prerequisite that aims to create fairer decision-making earlier in the hiring process when dealing with criminal history. However, even though it was designed to reduce discrimination against people with criminal records, the ban on requesting criminal record information appears to have resulted in greater employment discrimination against African Americans. Why? because employers' implicit and explicit biases assumed African-American applicants had criminal records. Inclusion requires that you see the value and worth in others. It sometimes requires that you get up out of your comfort zone. Growing up, I grew up in the island, Trinidad and Tobago. I love to sing Bob Marley's songs. And one of his lyrics, get up, stand up, stand up for your rights. I would go around the house singing that all the time. <laughs> I love that song. But I did not truly grasp the significance of those words and what was being said in those nine words until I could not stand. I was in my teens when I lost the use of my right side because of a nerve disorder. For over a year, I needed assistance and use, and still use as needed, assistive devices to maneuver through an able-bodied world. Today is one of my good days. A request for reasonable accommodations is a request to be included so that the person requesting the accommodation can participate fully without barriers. The Americans with Disabilities Act was enacted to address this issue. 
It prohibits discrimination against qualified individuals with disabilities in all areas of public life, including employment, public services, public accommodations, and services to the public operated by private entities. In recent years, there has been a lot of training on bias, specifically implicit bias. The training is meant to have us look at the subconscious bias belief or opinions that we have about others. Unfortunately, after all of the training we've had, it appears that we are seeing more and more manifestations of bias. Do you know what is the difference between implicit and explicit bias to the receiver? Nothing. Absolutely nothing. There is no difference to the person on the other end of it. It is my humble opinion that the people we serve could care less about our subjective implicit bias as it is only implicit to us. What matters is that you've manifested it and now it is known. In other words, it is explicit and always has been explicit to the receiver as he or she cannot read your mind. As, <laughs> as public servants, we must also focus on the impact of our actions and not on just our intent. What's relevant to the person on the receiving end of our action is the impact it has on them and not what you or I intended. Implicit biases that deter or prohibit underrepresented or marginalized individuals or groups from participating must also be addressed. As you brainstorm, brainstorm at this summit, here are some of my thoughts. Stop the conscious or unconscious bias and exclusion of marginalized persons that presume we lack competence. Stop it. Stop the thought process that implies that underrepresented groups have less worthy candidates or that a more diverse workforce would somehow undermine the quality of your agency. Stop it. Stop confusing empathy with sympathy. <laughs> empathy requires you to walk in my shoes whereas sympathy makes you feel like you have to give me your shoes. The former is needed, not the latter. When your actions are called into question, it's important to recognize that what is being called into question are your actions, not your overall character. So don't take it personally, just try to understand. Be careful of oppressive language or actions your subjective intent does not really matter if your action has the impact of furthering the marginalization or oppression that you are trying to address. Listening is extremely important. So listen with every intent to understand and work towards changing the behavior. For solutions to be found during your discussions, you must remove your privileged mindset and understand that not everything is about you. Discrimination based on race is still very much an issue in this country. And four years ago, in a dissenting opinion, Justice Sonia Sotomayor said it best. Race matters for reasons that really are only skin deep, that cannot be discussed in any other way, and that cannot be wished away. Race matters to a young man's view of society when he spends his teenage years watching others tense up as he passes, no matter the neighborhood where he grew up. Race matters to a young woman's sense of self when she states her hometown and then is pressed, no, where are you really from? Regardless of how many generations her family has been in the country. 
Race matters to a young person addressed by a stranger in a foreign language, which he does not understand because only English was spoken at home. Race matters because of the slights, the snickers, the silent judgments that reinforce that most crippling of thoughts. I do not belong here. Justice Sotomayor went on to say that the way to stop discrimination on the basis of race is to speak openly and candidly on the subject of race, with eyes open to the unfortunate effects of centuries of racial discrimination. She said we ought not sit back and wish away rather than confront the racial inequality that exists in our society. Now, ladies and gentlemen, discrimination is not new. And whether it is based on race, gender, sexual orientation, disability, or immigration status, it is, it has been, and it will always be wrong. Creating a space, a safe space for sharing and exchanging experiences and ideas is necessary to finding solutions. As the gatekeepers to access, your charge is to dismantle the historical policies and procedures that disenfranchised and marginalized individuals from participation in your government agencies. You may not have been around or responsible for it, but you are there now. So it is your responsibility to dismantle it. The change you are seeking is within you and must come from you. The systemic institutional barriers in place for a multi-marginalized person like me are vast. I was not to be standing here, and I was not to be standing here before you as a judge. But I encountered many gatekeepers over the years that gave me access. To them, my lens mattered, my voice mattered, and my presence mattered. To them, I mattered. And I paid back by being accessible, visible, vocal, and vigilant. The challenges you face require that you think outside the box in formulating solutions to the systemic discrimination that still permeates many of our government agencies. Open the circle. As many of us are standing outside, and there is a wealth of talent that is being overlooked at all levels. My hope, it went away. <laughs> okay. My hope is that one day you will not have to think outside the box because diversity, equity, and inclusion would have moved to the forefront of your mind. Let us learn from our past and not repeat the mistakes of the past. In the present, let us continue to work together respectfully to find solutions. This will ensure that we can share a peaceful, cohesive, and bright future together. I did a TEDx talk in 2016, and I'll end with it. We have differences, but we are not truly different. Thank you. many in this room can tell you, as you yourself probably know, I'm not usually at a loss for words. <laughs> and I thank you on behalf of everyone at the sound of my voice and those who are not here for keeping it real, reminding us that we are gatekeepers for opportunity, and I extend blessings to those who saw that you matter and appreciate you for paying that forward and imparting that into us, reminding us that not only do we matter, but we matter to those who we serve. We honor you, we bless you, and we thank you. Did I give you a hug yet? <laughs> Don't leave.
And we have a thank you and our sincere appreciation to you from the employees of the state of Washington and our partners on our first annual statewide diversity, equity, and inclusion summit. May you display this on your wall of fame, knowing that you made a difference in our lives. Bless you. Thank you. Signed by Governor Jay Inslee. He appointed you. Thank you. Thank you.